Good evening. How is everyone? Oh, you sound good. That's good. The first time I ever came to this church was actually August of 1996. We had just started uh, raising our support the first time to go to the field. And I came here to go to the School of Discipleship, actually. And uh, I can't tell you how much that helped us in the ministry. Basically, everything you saw, everything we did was built around that. Um, personally, in 18 years, I only discipled one-on-one -on -one about 14 men. But those men, uh, you know, we had just... I set it out like a pyramid. We had over 100 people. You know, we did one year of discipleship with over 100 people through the years. And, you know, cumul cumulatively, you know, it's hard to imagine, you know, that 100 years of discipleship, isn't it? But it's a blessing to, to think the involvement that First Bible Baptist Church had in that and in our ministry. So I'm tickled to death to be here. You know how that translates in the third world, right, when you're translating into Bimba. That translates, we scratched ourselves until we died. Tickled to death to be here. Yeah, that, that joke was just to get that in there. I'll uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 5 as you do. I'll enlarge on a few things that uh, were in the video. The area that we plan to go now is about 500 miles from where we were previously. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you might be with the geography of Zambia. I know Zambia is very important around here with the Jellowex and the Peskies and the uh, missionaries in the past. But when you look at Zambia, there's a pedicle of the Congo that comes down in the middle of the country. And if you cross from where we are in the Copper Belt over through that pedicle of the, Con the Congo, you'll come eventually to a town called Kasama. And it's right in the middle of the northern province of Zambia. And Lord willing, we're planning on going there. We're going to do some surveying when we get back and see what the Lord has there. I do believe it's good if you have some type of group of people, some type of nucleus to rally around you if you do start a work. So we're going to see if maybe... We can take some trips and try to develop that. Uh, while you're in 2 Corinthians 5, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i quote you Romans 6.23 in foreign languages. Amen. Everybody knows Romans 6.23, right? The wages of sin is death and so on. Uh, it goes like this in Bimba. Panto amalipilo yalo bembu nimfwa. Lelo ichabu pechakwa lesa mweo wa muiayaya. Muli yesu christu shiku wifwe. I told the guys last night in the Tuesday prayer meeting, I said, when I saw the tenses of Bimba on the wall in the, the Bimba school, I looked at those tenses. They said there are 26. They began to laboriously explain why there are 26 tenses. And I prayed and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I just want to say I'm never going to learn this language in Jesus' name. Amen. It looked like impossible to me. But you know, it just goes to show you whether it be your walk with Christ or whatever it is, learning an instrument, whatever it is in life, you'd be amazed what can be done with a little building block every day, isn't it? You take a little building block every day, and a few years go by, and, and what I knew was impossible that day eventually came to fruition, and the Lord blessed it. Uh, come to 2 Corinthians 5. We'll start there. We'll read verse 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Ready? Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on the, the lesson and the message this evening. We pray the Spirit of God would glorify your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray for every uh, saved and born-again person in this room that you would help us uh, to be edified and to be in tune with you on what your desire is for missions in this world. Lord, I pray that uh, perhaps if there's someone here tonight you've been dealing with, Lord, about a calling, Lord, I pray you'd uh, make things more and more clear and, and speak and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And Lord, we pray that uh, as a result of this hour, uh, the lost truly might be reached and might be evangelized both in the community here and around the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Now, of course, the, you might know the David Livingston Memorial where you know, they, they took his heart and put it in Africa and then took his body to Westminster Abbey. That m memorial is in Zambia. And I've never been there. It's off the beaten path of, of everywhere I go, so I've never been. But they say there is a plaque there with this verse, verse 14, that says in large letters, the love of Christ constraineth us. And of course, you know, Dr. Livingston, there, there are many things said and written about him. I read a book uh, by an author named Tim Geale. It's an excellent book. He was given all the family memoirs. Uh, all the journals that Dr. Livingston wrote were given 
uh, just in recent years, the last 10 years to that author. And there are many things in the book, but, but one of the things that impresses me the most is even this, this author who's not a Christian, he gets down to the end of the life of David Livingston and he says, somehow David Livingston looked ahead as a visionary and said, if we do this and this and this, if we stop the slave trade and, and do these different things, a massive missions movement will come here. And how did he know that? You know, th this author who's not a Christian says, he saw, we saw this come to fruition. David Livingston had this, and he changed the world in his generation. And I say tonight, go and do thou likewise. And you, you may say, well, I'm just a mom. You will. If you raise that child for the Lord, you may indeed change the world in your generation. You may raise a child that does something you could never imagine. I can assure you, my mom did not think I'd be a missionary to Africa. Amen? I can assure you of that. Now, my grandmother one day came over and said, I knew he'd be a preacher. I wonder if she prayed, don't you? Make that boy a preacher. Because my, grand, my grandmother said, I'm not surprised that boy's a preacher. Everybody else was. So I don't know what she was praying about. What will you do to change the world in your generation? Look at verse 14. We're going to look at three deaths from this passage that are involved. Kind of fitting, isn't it, in the, the week of the resurrection week? We're going to look at three deaths involved in spreading the gospel. Verse 14, if you have your eye go down to the end of the verse, it says, If one died for all, then we're all dead. We'll take that phrase at the end of the verse that says, Then we're all dead. That's the death of the lost, the condition of the lost. Now, if you're, if you're saved in Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You know, I, I think it's a little bit humorous nowadays that there's the fascination of, you know, the walking dead and zombies. And I, I had a friend, you know, they, they showed me a picture not long ago because my wife was doing some of the old-fashioned southern canning, you know, or canning some things. And, and they showed me this. It looks like an old Norman Rockwell painting, you know, and the lady's canning and the little girl says, Mommy, why do we can so much? And, and she says, well, dear, because the zombies are coming. You know, it's... It doesn't really fit in the Norman Rockwell picture, does it? But, but nowadays, the fascination is with that. Why? Well, because the man without Jesus Christ, the man without the Spirit of God, what is he? He's walking around, isn't he? But it says, then we're all dead. He's got a dead spirit. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't have the Holy Ghost of God in him. So therefore, he is the walking dead, isn't he? You say, I don't see it, preacher. Get in the Bible. Read the Bible some. Get to where you can see past the physical past the body and say, yeah, there's a soul in there. You know, the, the video we made, when I made that, I thought, you know, I wasn't feeling great. I was feeling kind of ill, and I thought, you know, I'm getting, getting older, I'm going out into eternity. <laughs> so we put the name of that video at the beginning, Eternity. And we talked about eternal souls in the video. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, then we're all dead. Ephesians 2, verse 12 says, the lost are without hope and without God in this world. Someone needs hope. As, as the pastor said, they're on your street. They're not just 12,000 miles away in Africa. They're on your street. They're next door. And they're living a life and they're saying, is this all there is to life? I just go to work and come home and go to work and come home. And I do this, I go on vacation. And is this all there is to life? And, and they're alone in the world without hope. And there you are. Their hope is that you will take the gospel and say, it's true, there, there's a death for the lost, but there's life and there's hope in Jesus Christ. Beyond the lost who are needing to be quickened, the Bible says in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But what about you? The righteous into life eternal. One day there'll be a separation between you and your neighbors. And I hope you've done your best. As the song says, I, I hope you've done your best for Jesus. One preacher said this, he said, the vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the conscience of millions. Isn't it true? Isn't it true nowadays people look at God and they say, I think God must be a lot like me. I don't think God would ever punish anyone. I don't think God would ever bring man into account. But we who know the scriptures, we know it's true. God looks upon man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? God's looking down and he's saying, I'm, I'm keeping account. And you're supposed to step up and say, 
You know, I, I know God is going to punish. God is going to bring into judgment. One preacher said this. He said, if sinners be condemned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. And if hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go there unwarned or unprayed for. Let me ask you tonight, my friend, your concern for the world, for the lost, for reaching people, does it sound like that word, exertion? Or does it sound more like the word indifference? and unconcerned. Where are you on that? You know, there's a man in John chapter 5, he's called, um, he's the man by the pool of Bethesda there. And the Lord comes to him and he says, um, would you be made whole? And he says, I've been here 38 years. And he says, but, but would you may, be made whole? And he says, sir, I have no man when the water is stirred to put me in the water. Now, I don't know if that's your neighbor. I don't know if your neighbor is going to say to the Lord, you know, I had no one. No man cared for my soul. John, uh, Job 4.20 says, They perish forever without any regarding it. I hope at least they'll look up and say, You know, I did have that neighbor. He annoyed me. He would talk to me about these things. And at least he can look back and say, I had one chance. I had a chance. I had someone who was at least a speed bump in my life to slow me down and say, Think. Think about eternity. You know, maybe there's someone here tonight. I mentioned it when I prayed. I sat in church several years, about five years, as a young person. And I would see the missionaries come through and hear the missionaries. And I, did have an, I had a desire to go to all the countries. They all looked great to me. They, they really did. But then one day I started to hear a calling. And I thought, wow, that's unmistakable. I didn't have to go to anyone and say, is this a calling? I was afraid to. I was afraid... You know, I'm, I'm sure many of you know Brett Haas. Brett Haas was my youth director, and I was, I was very afraid to ask him that question. I was very afraid to go to Brett and describe this condition and say, is this a calling? Because I knew he would say, it is. So I didn't. <laughs> I just waited. And then one day in 1991 in a church, the preacher said, if you're young and you're healthy and you're not in debt, you should go to the mission field. And I thought, that's not fair. That's not fair. How does he know that I'm young and not in... How does he know I'm not in debt? I mean, I, I, I took it very personally. I was, sitting, I was sitting back on the inner aisle with a brand new baby that was born in August 91. That was November 1991. And the call was a very clear thing. You know, Hudson Taylor, one day, I think it was 1886, 1887, he said, we need 100 missionaries in China. So I'm going to go back to my country. I'm going to, to try to rally 100 missionaries in a year. And he did. Amazing. Over a five-year period, he said, we've got to stay here. There are millions in China. Let's take five years and try to rally 1,000 missionaries. 100, 153. 1,153 missionaries rallied. Can you imagine in America today? You know, as, as we missionaries go around, Brother Ireland, I hear him say amen. As we missionaries go around today, we hope one. We hope in all the places we speak, we hope we can say, there was one. I remember it. I remember back in 1998, 99, I remember there was one. That's amazing, isn't it? The call of God, I believe it's there. I just don't know if men are walking to where they can hear it. You know, the love of Christ constrained those that went in the past. And those that go today, they say, the love of Christ constrained me. Livingston one time said, the love of Christ compelled me. The death of the lost. Look at verse 14 again. In verse 14, we read at the end of the verse, it says, if one died for all, the next death in the passage is the death of the Lamb of God. Not just the death of the lost, but the death of the Lamb of God. One died for all. Galatians 1, 4 says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. The Lord Jesus Christ on the cross did not just give a sacrifice. He gave himself. The old rugged cross made the difference. The song says, he gave his life. What more could he give? What more can you give than your life? How can it be the death of one man paid for the sins of the world. You know, I go to the college campus a lot. I, 
I, I gather the young people around. I say, let's talk. Tell me where you are. Tell me what you think. You know, t- you know if I'm really wrong, tell me where I'm wrong. Point it out. Let's d- you know, at least discuss it with me. And they'll say, I think it's foolishness to believe one man died for all. And I'll say, it's very well said. 1 Corinthians 1.18. You're exactly right. For the preaching of the cross is to who? To them that perish. Foolishness. And you see the heads kind of, because now we've classified ourselves, haven't we? (laughs) If you believe that preaching of the cross is foolishness, it says it's to them that perish, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. You know, the Lord said, I'll confound the wisdom of the wise. I'll send a baby into the world that even the most powerful king can't kill. How did it happen that, that King Herod said, I'm going to find that baby, I'm going to look for that baby, and a king couldn't kill a baby. God manifest in the flesh. You know, the, the soldier on the cross looked up after, at the crucifixion and said, truly, this was a righteous man. You read the other passage in Mark? He looked and he said, truly, this was the Son of God. That's the difference. The difference that causes that baby to come up and one day at 30 years old be manifest and then have a ministry of three and a half years and die for the sins of the world is because that's God manifest in the flesh. Mark 10 says this, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. You know what you have to do to believe one died for all? You have to condescend. You have to have humility and get down and say, Truth, Lord, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord made a plan of salvation that the proud man cannot come to. He has to get down and humble himself like a little child and believe one died for all and receive the one who died for all. Acts 20, 21 says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, the death of the Lamb of God. Then verse 15. Verse 15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live. Who is that? The other day I I was talking about this in a church, and and out the window you could see the cemetery, you know, the church and the cemetery. And I said, now is that that those guys? Or is that the people in here? They which live, that's the audience tonight. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. We talked about last night in the men's prayer meeting about taking up your cross. And the Lord said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, if the gospel is going to go around the world, if the gospel is going to spread, the saints of God will have to deny themselves. Selfishness is the greatest prohibition to missions. The greatest thing that can stop the missions movement is for me to say, what about me? What's in this for me? Selfishness must be put down and crucified if men are to leave their families, their homes, their country, and go overseas. Furthermore, selfishness will have to be put down in your own own life just to go next door. You know, what what the pastor was talking about is, is a life where you go outside and you say, it's true, I don't want to walk the dog, but I'm so concerned about that guy with that light on in that house. You know, that's not natural. That's not the natural normal man. The normal man says, well, I know he's got problems, but I'm going to think about me. I'm going to meditate on me. I'm going to pray about me. (laughs) And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. They which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Selfishness must be put down and crucified if we in this country take what God's given us financially and say, I'm going to help someone else. I'm going to give to missions. You know, I, I was very young the first time I got the, my 1099 back where I'd given to missions and to church, and I looked at that, and I, I was surprised. I thought, what? I could have gone on a cruise with that. I, I need a car. I could have bought a car. It, was a, it would have been a cheap one, okay? It would have been a cheap car, but I thought, I need a car. I could have bought a car. And, and after about two and a half minutes, I thought, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, I gave that to you. I gave that for the the furtherance of the gospel. I'm sorry, Lord, but but you know the alarming thing is, you know, I was probably 20 years old then, 18, 19, 20. Now I'm 48. 
and I go to open that 1099 this year, and, and I know that thing's coming. You say, doesn't it ever stop? It doesn't. It doesn't. That, so now I give it about half a second to a second and a half, somewhere in there. I open that thing, and, I, and then, I, then I put the knife in it and say, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going to think like that. We're going to say, Lord, eternity's coming soon. I'm going to meet all that one day and say, thank God I did that. Thank the Lord. There was something akin to a sacrifice that was made in my life. Selfishness must be put down and crucified just to pray for the missionary. You know, I watched those men last night, and it, was, it had an effect on me to think, Men come here on Tuesday night at 9 o'clock at night and pray for missionaries and pray for needs and pray for others. It's a fulfillment of Philippians 2, 4 where it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. It's Christianity. They which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Somehow, the focus must go from me and mine to others. Somehow the vision must be of eternal souls, not my comfort, my money, my time, my job, my family, my health. Where does that thinking need to go? It needs to go on the cross. Climb up. <laughs> you say, it's going to hurt. I know it's going to hurt. I, I understand. People used to ask me when, when we were first going to Zambia, they would say, are you taking your children? And, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I do love sarcasm. I believe it's a beautiful art. And sometimes I would say, no, we were going to leave them here four years at a time. And they would say, really? Because, you know, I can sell these things, you know. And, and they would say, you are? And I would say, no. And they would, they would always say this, aren't you afraid they'll die? And I'll say, well, you know, um, you know people die in America. And they would say, yeah, people do die in America. And my wife used to say this. She used to say, you know, if I use my children as an excuse not to go to the mission field, the Lord can take my excuse away. And I used to think, wow, that's, that's a little deeper thought than I normally think. I don't usually think like that. You know, but people used to ask me, will the children survive? And, and the night before, the very first time, we left June 28, 1998 to, to move to Zambia. Our, our son was two years old, Scott, the one out on the, the display on the left. He's 21 now. And we'd been out, we'd had them out at Six Flags all day, and they were run down, they were tired. And he'd always had some problems breathing. But that night, in the middle of the night, you know, I heard, I heard him with the, we were in real wheezy. <gasps> and so I thought, that's strange. And he did it a couple more times, so I turned the light on and I looked at him. And you know, you know what you do as a parent, you know, you see if his stomach's moving, right? Put your hand down to see if you can feel any breath. And I watched him for about five minutes, and I thought, I don't think he's breathing. So I, I knocked on the door of the guy who was with us on the adjoining room that had driven us there, and we called 911, and that guy started the shower with the steam to try to get him breathing, you know, and, and he, started, <laughs> he started breathing, you know, and, and the people came and checked his oxygen. They said, fair enough, he seems okay. Take him to the hospital tomorrow. And I said, ma'am, tomorrow we're going to Africa. And she said, yeah, you don't need to do that. I said, thanks very much. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Thanks. It was 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and she, so, you know, I went out behind the hotel and got down into the grass <laughs> on my knees and said, Lord, we're in your hand. We're not in the hand of man. <laughs> and, and I knew generations of people, for generations people had taken the gospel and they lost their family and their loved ones and they had. And I said, Lord, we're no better. We're not better than those people. We're going to go and we're going to trust you with what happens. And I didn't know Zambia was a dry climate and all his breathing problems would be, would be cleared up. I had no idea. I knew nothing. I just rejoiced in it, that the Lord would take care of us. But people ask, you know, well, is there going to be a terrible car accident? And I say, well, I don't know. I, I have no idea. They say, are you going to get malaria? And I say, more than likely. I mean, Letitia never has. Because, you know, the rest of us got malaria. But you're going to get malaria. They say, is the power going to go off? You say, oh, yeah, the power is going off. Internet access, cut it out. We don't worry about internet access. If we have it, we have it. But what am I saying? Your flesh steps forward and says, what about me? And the Bible says, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him who died. And this weekend you're going to talk extensively about, and he rose again. 
The lost, we saw the death of the lost, they're dying at a terrific rate. They'll perish forever. The question I want you to ask yourself is, do I care? Do I genuinely care? The death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, it is sufficient. It is sufficient to save the lost. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. Then the third death, if the gospel be spread and the world be reached, every Christian must do something to deny himself and jump into the battle for eternal souls. May God bless His Word. Amen. Pastor. Thank you, Brother Mike. Appreciate the message. Very simple. Hits the nail right on the head. How many of y'all enjoyed that here tonight? Very powerful. We want to we wanna get behind what the, what the Dobbins are trying to do. We're going to receive an offering here tonight. Gentlemen, if you will make your way forward, we will receive that offering. Uh, as a church, we want to do more than receive a one-time offering. I, I spoke with uh, Don Curran about our missions budget. And uh, we would like to begin to support this family on a monthly basis. And so um, it looks like that's something we're going to be able to do as well. Uh, Brother Mike, he said a lot of things. And, you know, some of it really is quite challenging that, you know, if you're going to crucify yourself, there's going to be some pain involved in that. And oftentimes we want to do what is Christian. We want to do what the Scripture calls us to. We, we want to see God's will accomplished. We just don't want to be uncomfortable. We just don't want it to hurt at all. We just, we just don't want to get outside of our comfort zone at all in order to do what God has called us to do. There is a need in this world for missionaries to be called out of this church to go into lands way beyond Monroe County and New York State way beyond uh, the United States and Canada and Mexico. There's people, and, and, and we pray often that God would send people from this church to go to the places like Kasama and Chapata and around the world so that people would have that one opportunity to hear the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to take people, and, you know, we can often look and say, well, I, I, I you know, I've, I've got all these reasons why I, 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 I can't do it. You know, there's that phrase in the Scripture that always gets me. You know, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Don't you wish you could take some of those out of there sometimes and just say, ah, you know, not for me, not now. I realize there's certain people, Mike and, and Letitia, it's obvious that God's call is on them. You know what's obvious? That the command to go into the world is given to all people. All of God's people are required to be a part of the mission to reach this world with the gospel. We need to do our part as a church. I want to do that. Let's pray. We'll receive this offering. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for Mike and Letitia. Would you continue to pour out your favor upon them? And God, upon their children. God, would you watch over them as they depart the United States. God, would you lead them and, uh, and make their path straight. Lord, bless Mike as he speaks uh, into the hearts of the Zambian people. Bless Letitia as she seeks to disciple ladies and to teach and to find her role in all of this. God, would your hand be upon them for good and would many come to the knowledge of the truth because of them. For God, we ask all of this that you would be glorified. Bless now this offering this night, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please do give generously if you can. And if you, uh, if you didn't come with cash in your hand or didn't come with a check in your pocket, you can always text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 585-332-2010, 585-332-2010. The word GIVE, you can put your credit card information in there, choose the number that you want to do in Wednesday offering from the pull-down, and uh, we'll make sure that that money gets to the Dobbins family. So uh, may God bless you in all of that. Just as a reminder, this, this Sunday we will be having a commissioning service for the Flower City Work Camp. 
uh, that will be starting on Monday. Uh, although this Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, we will not have baptism this Sunday. We're going to push it off till the, till the 9th, okay? So I know there's some people that have been talking to me about baptism. I know there's some still in here today that you need to be baptized, and some of you in here today, your children need to be baptized. And um, you're asking, well, why isn't God blessed in my life? Why, you know, baptism is one of the first things you can do to say to God, uh, I, want to, I want to be faithful in my commitment to you. I want to do what, what, is, uh, what is right before the Lord. So uh, do consider baptism and membership and, and what it looks like. And, you know, Mike said he's going around the world to, to, to give the gospel to people, and, and, and some of us, we need to go there too. And some of us, we need to be the light and the salt of the world right here and right now. Maybe we need to make that commitment to say, you know, I, I may not be called. I don't feel that call in my heart to get on a plane and go 12,000 miles to learn Itchy Bimba and, and eat Shima and caterpillars and tell people about the gospel. But I, you know what, I do feel that need to walk across the street. I do feel the need to, to, to go to the cubicle next to me and say, hey, would you come to church on Sunday? Man, you know what I want to do is, as a church? I want us to not, I don't want to ever guilt or shame people into doing the things of God. What I want to see is a church that has that volitional spirit, that desire to, to just please and serve the Lord in, in whatever capacity that looks like, that, that we're just not going to wait uh, to be pushed into something, but we're going to do it because it's what the Bible tells us to do, right? And because it's, in essence, it's what's pleasing unto the Father and, what, and, what, and it's the love of Christ that constrains us. Years ago, people told me, man, you must really love the Zambian people to be there. And I chuckled a little bit. <laughs> like, I, I mean, they're nice people and all, but they're people. You know, when you first get to a foreign mission field, you, you're really in love with the people. You said these people that came from Haiti, right? You come back, oh, these people, they're so, yeah, okay. The Zambian people, you're there for some, oh, it's so wonderful, it's amazing, these people, and and your heart is exploding over this, and then you stay there for a year or two years or five years or ten years, and you go, these people, they stink. <laughs> so people say, well, why would you ever go do this? Because it's, it's the love of Christ. It's not the love of people. It's the love of Christ. I mean, now he does give you a love for the people, but if it was a love for the people, I'll tell you what, Mike Dobbins wouldn't be in Zambia for 18 years. We would have never made it 11 years. Mike, you would have never made it in Ukraine for all those years that you have as well. And, and all, it's the love of Christ that constrains us to do the work and the will of God. I'm so glad you've been here today. I hope you were blessed. We have a uh, special youth choir that is taking place this Sunday morning. And so what's going to happen right now is as soon as we're dismissed, the Awana kids and the youth, they are going to come in here and do a rehearsal for that choir special on Sunday morning. Does that make sense? Okay. So what you need to do is you need to go get your kid. Okay. Now, I know some of y'all, you like to do the fellowship thing again. You like to drag your feet because somebody has your kid in nursery, which means that you don't, you know, you get some free time, adult conversation. I'm sorry, that's out tonight, Okay. Go get your kids so that everybody can be involved in this and we don't have to be here all night going through this. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you as you go. Don't forget as you go on out, Mike and Letitia have a table, a missionary table. They have cards that you can get from them. Those cards will allow you to pray and remember them. Thank you so much.